Chapter 43. Differential Rent 2. Third Case. Rising Price of Production. Results. A rising price of production presupposes a decline in productivity on the lowest quality of land, which pays no rent. The production price we have taken as the governing one can rise above three pounds per quarter only if the two and a half pounds invested on A produces less than one quarter, or the five pounds less than two, or if a still poorer soil than A has to be brought into cultivation. Given that the productivity of the second capital investment remains the same or even rises, this would only be possible if the productivity of the first capital investment of two and a half pounds had declined. This case is found often enough. For example, if the exhausted topsoil gives declining yields on superficial plowing, as long as the old method of cultivation is maintained, until the subsoil subsequently supplies higher yields than before when rational techniques lead to its being turned up. Strictly speaking, however, this special case does not belong here. The falling productivity of the first capital investment of two and a half pounds leads to a fall in the first form of differential rent for the better types of land, even if conditions there are taken as analogous. Here, however, we are concerned only with the second form of differential rent. But since the present special case cannot come about unless we assume that the second form of differential rent is already in existence, for it in fact represents the impact on the second form of a modification in the first form, we shall give an example of it. Both rent and yield are the same in money terms as in Table 2. The increased governing price of production exactly makes up for the deficit in the quantity produced. Since the two things vary in inverse proportion, it is evident that their product remains the same. In the following case, we assume that the productivity of the second capital investment is higher than the original productivity of the first investment. It is the same if we take the productivity of the second investment as simply the same as the original, as in the following Table 8. Here, too, a production price that has risen in the same proportion fully makes up for the decline in productivity, both for product and money rent. The third case emerges in its pure form only in a situation of falling productivity on the second capital investment, while that on the first investment remains constant, as was assumed throughout in the first and second cases. Here, differential rent 1 is not affected, and the change takes place solely in the proportion arising from differential rent 2. We give two examples. In the first, the productivity of the second capital investment is reduced to a half, and in the second example, to a quarter. Table 9 is the same as Table 8, except that the decline in productivity in 8 falls on the first capital investment, while that in 9 falls on the second. In this Table 2, the total yield, money rental, and rate of rent remain the same as in Tables 2, 7, and 8, because the product and the sale price again vary in inverse proportion, while the capital investment remains the same. What is the position, though, in the other possible situation, with a rising price of production, in particular if inferior land, which it previously did not pay to cultivate, is now taken in to cultivation? Let us assume that this land, which we can call small a, enters into competition with the others. The formerly non-rent-bearing land a would then yield a rent, and the above tables 7, 8, and 10 would take on the following form as tables 7a, 8a, and 10a. The intervention of land small a gives rise to a new differential rent of the first form. On this new basis, differential rent 2 also develops in a different form. In each of the three above tables, land small a has a different fertility. The series of proportionally rising fertilities only begins with a. Accordingly to, therefore, the series of rising rents. The rent of the poorest rent-bearing land, which formerly did not bear rent at all, forms a constant that is simply added on to all higher rents. It is only after this constant is deducted that the series of differences for the higher rents clearly emerges, and so too their parallelism with the series of land types arranged according to fertility. In all these tables, the fertilities from A to D are in the ratios 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and the rents are accordingly in 7A as 1 to 1 plus 7 to 1 plus 2 times 7 to 1 plus 3 times 7, in 8A as 1.2 to 1.2 plus 7.2 to 1.2 plus 2 times 7.2, to 1.2 plus 3 times 7.2, and in 10a as 2 thirds to 2 thirds plus 6 and 2 thirds to 2 thirds plus 2 times 6 and 2 thirds to 2 thirds plus 3 times 6 and 2 thirds. In short, if the rent of a is x and the rent of the land of next higher fertility is x plus y, the series is x to x plus y to x plus 2y to x plus 3y, etc. Note from Friedrich Engels. Since the above third case was not elaborated in the manuscript, there is only the title, 
it remained the task of the editor to complete this as best he could. Besides this, he also has to draw the resulting general conclusions from the overall investigation of Differential Rent 2 in its three major and nine subordinate cases. For this purpose, however, the examples given in the manuscript are of little help. Firstly, they compare lands whose yields for equal areas are in the ratios 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, i.e. differences that are sharply exaggerated right from the start, and which lead to completely impossible figures when calculations are made on this basis. Secondly, they give a completely false impression. If fertilities in the ratios 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, etc., lead to a series of rents in the ratio 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, etc., we feel able to derive the second series immediately from the first and explain the doubling, tripling, etc. of rents from the doubling, tripling, etc. of the total yields, but this would be completely mistaken. Rents stand in the ratios 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 whenever the scale of fertility is 1 of n to n plus 1 to n plus 2 to n plus 3 to n plus 4. It is not the absolute level of fertility, but rather the differences in fertility reckoned from the non-rent-bearing land as the zero point that give the ratio of rents. Marx's original tables had to be given for the sake of understanding the text itself, but in order to give an intuitive basis to the results of the investigation that follow below, I shall now provide a new series of tables in which the yields are given in bushels and shillings. The first table, that is table 11, corresponds to the former table 1. It shows the yields and rents for five qualities of land, A to E, for a first capital investment of 50 shillings, with which 10 shillings profit makes a total of 60 shillings in production costs. The yields of corn are given low values, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18 bushels per acre. The governing production price resulting from this is 6 shillings per bushel. The subsequent 13 tables correspond to the three cases of differential rent 2 dealt with in this chapter and the two previous ones for an additional capital investment on the same land of 50 shillings per acre and a price of production that may be constant, falling, or rising. Each of these cases is again presented in the shape it assumes, one, with the same productivity for the second capital investment as for the first, two, with a falling productivity, and three, with rising productivity. A few variants arise in this connection which are particularly useful by way of illustration. In case 1, that is, with the price of production constant, we have, variant 1, productivity remains the same for the second capital investment, see table 12. Variant 2, productivity falls. This can happen only if no second investment is made on land A, and moreover, either 1, in such a way that land B likewise yields no rent, see table 13, or B, in such a way that land B is not completely devoid of rent, see table 14. And variant 3, productivity rises, see table 15. This case 2 excludes a second capital investment on land A. In case 2, where the production price falls, we have variant 1, productivity remains the same for the second investment, see table 16. Variant 2, the productivity falls, see table 17. These two variants both mean that land A is removed from competition, land B ceasing to bear rent and coming to govern the production price, and variant 3, productivity rises, see table 18. Here, land A remains the governing one. In case 3, where the price of production rises, two modalities are possible. Land A may remain non-rent-bearing and price-governing, or else land inferior to A in quality may come into competition and govern price, which means that A then does yield rent. First modality, land A continues to govern price. Variant 1, productivity remains the same for the second investment, see Table 19. This is permissible under our conditions only if the productivity of the first investment declines. Variant 2, the productivity of the second investment falls, see Table 20. This does not rule out the possibility that the productivity of the first investment may remain the same. And variant 3, the productivity of the second investment rises, see Table 21. This again reduces the productivity of the first investment. And the second modality, an inferior quality of land, denoted by small a, comes into competition. Land A begins to bear rent. Variant 1, productivity on the second investment remains the same, see Table 22. Variant 2, productivity falls, see table 23, and variant 3, productivity rises, see table 24. These three variants conform to the general conditions of the problem and require no special remarks. We now append the tables. The aforementioned graphics will not be read aloud for the recording. Please consult pages 853 to 857 of a physical or digital copy of the book for visual reference. These tables now give the following results. First of all, the series of rents is in exactly the same ratio as the series of differences in fertility, taking the non-rent-bearing, price-governing land as the zero point. It is not the absolute yields that determine rent, but simply the differences in yields. 
Whether the various types of land provide yields of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 bushels per acre, or 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, the rents are in both cases successively 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 bushels, or their respective monetary equivalents. What is far more important, however, is the result as regards the total rents yielded in the case of repeated capital investment on the same land. In five cases out of the 13 investigated, the total sum of rents also doubles with the capital investment. From 10 times 12 shillings, this becomes 10 times 24 shillings, or 240. These cases are Case 1, Variant 1, a constant price with a constant rise in production, see Table 12. Case 2, Variant 3, a falling price with an increasing rise in production, see Table 18. The first modality of case 3, a rising price where land A continues to govern price in all three variants, see tables 19, 20, and 21. In four cases, the rent rises to more than double, i.e. case 1 variant 3, constant price but increasing rise in production, see table 15, the total rent rises to 330 shillings. Case 3, second modality, where land A yields rent in all three variants, see Table 22, where rent is equal to 15 times 30, i.e. 450 shillings. Table 23, where rent is equal to 5 times 20 plus 10 times 28, being 380 shillings. And Table 24, where rent is equal to 5 times 15 plus 15 times 33 and 3 quarters, i.e. 581 and the quarter shillings. In one case, rent rises, but not to twice the rent in the case of the first capital investment and that is case 1 variant 2, price constant with falling productivity for the second investment under conditions in which B does not completely cease to bear rent. See table 14, where rent is equal to 4 times 6 plus 6 times 21, i.e. 150 shillings. Finally, only in three cases does the total rent for the second capital investment remain the same for all kinds of land as with the first investment. See table 11. These are the cases in which land A is withdrawn from competition and land B comes to govern price, thus ceasing to bear rent. Thus, not only does the rent for B disappear, it is also deducted from each following member of the rent series, and this is how the result is obtained. These cases are case 1, variant 2, when conditions are such that land A drops out, see table 13. The sum of rent is 6 times 20, i.e. 10 times 12 at 120 shillings, as in table 11, and case 2, variants 1 and 2. Here, land A necessarily drops out according to our assumptions, see table 16 and table 17, and the sum of rents is again 6 times 20, equaling 10 times 12, equaling 120 shillings. This means, therefore, that in the great majority of all possible cases, rents rise, both per acre of the rent-bearing land and particularly in their total sum, as a result of increased capital investment on the land. Only in three cases out of the 13 investigated does the total rent remain unchanged, these are the cases where the most inferior quality of land, which formerly bore no rent and governed price, drops out of competition, and its place is taken by the next higher quality, which thus ceases to bear rent. But in these cases too, rents rise on the best types of land in comparison with the rents arising from the first capital investment. If the rent for C falls from 24 to 20 shillings, the rents for D and E rise from 36 and 48 to 40 and 60. A case of the total rent being below the level for the first capital investment, see Table 11, would be possible only if it was not just land A that dropped out of competition but also land B, so that land C ceased to bear rent and came to govern price. Thus, the more capital is applied to the land, and the higher the development of agriculture and civilization in general in a country, the higher are the levels of rent per acre and the total sum of rent, and the more gigantic, therefore, the tribute that society pays the great landowners in the form of surplus profits, as long as types of land once taken into cultivation all remain able to compete. This law explains the amazing vitality of the class of large landowners. No other social class lives in so extravagant a manner. No other class claims such a right as this does to a traditional luxury in keeping with its estate, irrespective of where the money for this comes from. No other class piles debts upon debts in such a lighthearted way. And yet, time and again, they fall on their feet, thanks to the capital of other people that is put into the soil and yields them rent, completely out of all proportion to the profits that the capitalist draws from this. The same law, however, also explains why this vitality of the large landowner is gradually approaching its end. When the Corn Laws were repealed in 1846, the English manufacturers believed that they had thereby made the landowning aristocracy into paupers. Instead, these aristocrats became richer than before. How did this happen? 
Very simply. First, they now insisted in their contracts that the farmers should invest 12 pounds a year on each acre instead of eight. While secondly, being represented in large numbers, even in the House of Commons, the landlords granted themselves a hefty state subsidy for drainage and other permanent improvements to their estates. Since the worst land was not totally withdrawn from cultivation, but was at most used temporarily for other purposes, rents rose in proportion to the increased capital investment, and the landed aristocracy did better than they had before. But everything comes to an end eventually. The transoceanic steamships and the railways in North and South America and in India made some quite singular tracts of land able to compete on the European corn markets. First, there were the North American prairies and the Argentine pampas, steps which nature itself has made arable, virgin soil that offered rich yields for years, even on rudimentary tilling and without fertilizer. Then there were the lands of the Russian and Indian communistic communities, which had to sell a portion of their product, and an ever-growing one at that, to get money for the taxes exacted by a merciless state despotism, often enough by torture. These products were sold with no regard for their costs of production, sold at the price which the dealer offered, because the peasant absolutely had to have money at the payment date. And faced with this competition, from virgin prairie soil and from Russian and Indian peasants succumbing to the screws of taxation, the European farmer or peasant could not survive at the old rents. One portion of European soil became definitively uncompetitive for corn growing, while everywhere rents fell. Our second case variant too, falling prices and falling productivity on the additional capital investment, became the rule in Europe, and hence the agrarian complaint from Scotland to Italy, from the south of France to East Prussia. Fortunately, not all prairie land has yet been brought into cultivation by a long chalk. Enough is still left to ruin European large-scale land ownership completely, and small-scale ownership into the bargain. End of the note from Friedrich Engels. We now have the following general result from considering differential rents as a whole. Firstly, the formation of surplus profits can occur in various ways. On the one hand, on the basis of differential rent 1, i.e. the investment of the total agricultural capital on an acreage consisting of types of land of differing fertility. Then as differential rent 2, on the basis of the varying differential productivity of successive capital investments on the same land i.e. a greater productivity is obtained in quarters of wheat, for example, than with the same capital investment on the most inferior land, which bears no rent, but governs the production price. No matter how these surplus profits might arise, their transformation into rent, i.e. their transfer from the farmer to the landowner, always presupposes as its initial condition that the various actual individual prices of production, i.e. those independent of the general production price that governs the market, which the partial products of the individual successive capital investments possess are equalized in advance to give an individual average price of production. The excess of this general governing production price of the product of an acre over the individual average production price forms and measures the rent per acre. In the case of the first form of differential rent, the differential results can be distinguished in and for themselves because they take place on different areas of land, outside and alongside one another given a capital outlay per acre that is taken as normal, and the normal cultivation corresponding to it. In the case of the second form, they must first be made distinguishable. They must, in fact, be transformed back into the first form, and this can only be done in the manner indicated. Let us take Table 3, for instance, on page 826. For the first capital investment of 2.5 pounds, land B yields 2 quarters per acre, and for the second capital of equal size, 1.5 quarters, a total of 3.5 quarters on the same acre. We cannot tell from this three and a half quarters, which grows all on the same land, how much is the product of capital investment number one and how much of capital investment number two. It is actually the product of the total capital of five pounds, and the fact of the matter is simply that a capital of two and a half pounds yielded two quarters, while one of five pounds yields not four but three and a half. It would be exactly the same if the five pounds were to yield four quarters, so that the yields of the two capital investments were equal, or even five quarters, so that the second capital investment produced an excess of one quarter. The production price of the first two quarters is one and a half pounds per quarter in our example, while that of the second one and a half quarters is two pounds per quarter. The three and a half quarters together therefore cost six pounds. This is the individual production price of the total product, and makes an average of one and five sevenths pounds per quarter. For the general production price of three pounds as determined by land A, this gives a surplus profit of one and two sevenths pounds per quarter, and thus for the three and a half quarters, a total of four and a half pounds. Given the average production price for B, this is expressed in one and a half quarters. 
B's surplus profit is thus expressed in an aliquot part of its product, the one and a half quarters that forms the rent expressed in corn, and is sold at four and a half pounds, given the general production price. But the extra product from an acre of B over that of an acre of A does not directly represent surplus profit, and hence surplus product. According to our assumption, the acre of B produces three and a half quarters, the acre of A only one quarter. The excess product on B is thus two and a half quarters, but the surplus product is only one and a half quarters, for twice as much capital is applied on B as on A, so that the production costs here are double. If there was a similar investment of five pounds on A, and the rate of productivity remained the same, its product would be two quarters instead of one. The surplus product would be found by comparing not the three and a half quarters and the one quarter, but rather the three and a half and the two quarters, so that it would not be two and a half quarters surplus, but only one and a half. Moreover, if B invested a third portion of capital of two and a half pounds, which yielded only one quarter, so that this quarter cost three pounds as on A, its sale price of three pounds would cover only the cost of production, yielding only the average profit and no surplus profit, and therefore nothing that could be transformed into rent. The product per acre of any other type of land compared with the product per acre of land A indicates neither whether it is the product of the same capital investment or a greater one, nor whether the excess product simply covers the production price or whether it is due to a higher productivity of the extra capital. Secondly, given a declining rate of productivity on the extra capital investments and the limiting capital investment as far as the formation of new surplus profit is concerned is the one that simply covers the production costs, i.e. that produces a quarter of wheat as expensively as the same capital investment would on an acre of land A, for five pounds on our assumption, it results from our previous argument that the limit at which the total capital investment on the acre of B would form no more rent is that at which the individual average production price of the product per acre of B would rise to the production price per acre of A. If B adds only capital investments that pay the production price, and thus do not form any surplus profit or new rent, then although this increases the individual average production price per quarter, it does not affect the surplus profit formed by the earlier capital investments, which would eventually affect the rent. For the average production price always remains below that of A, and if the extra price per quarter declines, the number of quarters increases in the same proportion, so that the total excess price remains the same. In the case taken here, the first two capital investments on B of five pounds each produce a yield of three and a half quarters, i.e. a rent of one and a half quarters, being four and a half pounds, according to our assumption. If a third capital investment of two and a half pounds is now added, which however only produces one extra quarter, the total production price of the four and a half quarters, including 20% profit, is nine pounds, i.e. the average price per quarter is now two pounds. The average production price per quarter on B has thus risen from one and five sevenths pounds to two, and the surplus profit per quarter, compared with the governing price of A, has fallen from one and two sevenths to one. But one times four and a half is four and a half, just as previously one and two sevenths times three and a half was four and a half. If we assume that fourth and fifth additional capital investments of two and a half pounds are made on B, each producing one quarter only at its general production price, the total product per acre would now be six and a half quarters, and its cost of production 15 pounds. The average production price per quarter for B would have risen again from two pounds to two and four thirteenths pounds, while the surplus profit per quarter, compared with the governing production price of A, would have fallen again from one pound to nine thirteenths of a pound. But this nine thirteenths of a pound would now be multiplied by six and a half quarters instead of four and a half quarters, and nine thirteenths times six and a half is the same as one times four and a half, i.e. four and a half pounds. The first thing that follows from this is that under these conditions, no increase in the governing production price is needed to make additional capital investments possible on the rent-bearing types of land, even up to the level at which the additional capital completely ceases to provide surplus profit and simply still yields the average profit. It also follows that the total surplus profit per acre remains the same here, no matter how much the surplus profit per quarter declines. This decline is always offset by a corresponding increase in the quarters produced per acre. In order that the average production price may rise to the general production price, i.e. in this case to three pounds for land B, additional capital must be added, the product of which has a higher production price than the governing one of three pounds. But we will see that even this is not by itself sufficient to drive up the average price of production per quarter on B to the general production price of three pounds. Let us assume that production on land B is as follows. One, three and a half quarters as before at a production price of six pounds, i.e. two capital investments of two and a half pounds each, 
which both form surplus profits but of decreasing size. 2. One quarter at three pounds, a capital investment in which the individual production price would be equal to the governing production price. And 3. One quarter at four pounds, a capital investment in which the individual price of production is 33 and a third percent higher than the governing price. We would then have five and a half quarters per acre at 13 pounds for a capital investment of 10 and 7 tenths of a pound. Four times the original capital investment, but less than three times the product of the first capital investment. Five and a half quarters at 13 pounds gives an average production price of two and four elevenths pounds per quarter, i.e. at the governing production price of three pounds, there is an excess of seven elevenths of a pound per quarter, which can be transformed into rent. Five and a half quarters for sale at the governing price of three pounds gives 16 and a half pounds. After deducting the production costs of 13 pounds, there remains three and a half pounds surplus profit or rent, which would represent approximately one and a half quarters at the prevailing average production price per quarter on B, which is two and four elevenths pounds. The money rent would have fallen by one pound, the corn rent by about a half a quarter. Yet despite the fact that the fourth extra capital investment on B, see heading three above, produces not only no surplus profit, but rather less than the average profit, there is still surplus profit and rent as before. If we assume that not only this fourth capital investment, but the third too, produces at over the governing production price in this way, the total production would be three and a half quarters at six pounds, plus two quarters at eight pounds, altogether five and a half for a production cost of 14. The average production price per quarter would be two and six elevenths pounds, and would leave a surplus of five elevenths of a pound. The five and a half quarters sold at three pounds per quarter give sixteen and a half pounds. Subtracting fourteen for the cost of production, two and a half pounds is left for rent. This would be fifty-five fifty-sixth of a quarter at the new average production price. Some rent is lost, although less than before. This shows us that the rent on the better lands need not disappear with additional capital investments whose production costs more than the governing production price, at least within the limits of permissible practice, but need only decline, this decline being in proportion on the one hand to the aliquot part that this relatively unproductive capital forms of the total capital outlay, and on the other hand to the decline in its productivity. The average price of its product would still always stand below the governing price, and would thus still leave a surplus profit which can be transformed into rent. Let us now assume that the average price for a quarter on B coincides with the general production price, as a result of four successive capital investments of two and a half pounds, two and a half pounds, five pounds, and five pounds, with a declining productivity. In this case, the farmer sells each quarter at its individual price of production, and hence sells the total number of quarters at their average production price per quarter, which coincides with the governing price of three pounds. Now as before, therefore, he makes a profit of 20%, being three pounds, on his capital of 15. But the rent has disappeared. Where does the surplus go when the individual production price of each quarter is equalized with the general production price in this way? The surplus profit on the first two and a half pounds was three pounds, on the second two and a half pounds, it was one and a half. The total surplus profit on this third of the capital advanced, i.e. on five pounds, was four and a half pounds, i.e. 90%. The third capital investment of five pounds not only yields no surplus profit, but its product of one and a half quarters, sold at the general price of production, brings a loss of one and a half pound. On the fourth capital investment, finally, which is also five pounds, the product of one quarter, sold at the general price of production, brings a loss of three pounds, these two capital investments together thus involve a loss of four and a half pounds, equal to the surplus profit of four and a half pounds produced by capital investments number one and two. The surplus profits and the losses of profit cancel out. The rent therefore vanishes. In fact, however, this is possible only because the elements of surplus value that formed surplus profit or rent now go into the formation of the average profit. The farmer makes this average profit of three pounds on 15, or 20%, at the expense of the rent. The establishment of equality between the individual average production price on B and the general production price on A, which governs the market, presupposes that the amount by which the individual price of the product of the earlier capital investments stands below the governing price is offset more and more and finally cancelled out by the amount by which the product of the later capital investments comes to stand above the governing price. What appears as surplus profit, as long as the product of the earlier capital investments is sold by itself, gradually becomes part of the average production price, and thereby goes into the formation of the average profit, until it is finally absorbed by this entirely. If instead of £15 capital, 
Only five pounds is laid out on B, and the extra two and a half quarters in the last table are produced by two and a half acres of A being freshly cultivated, with a capital investment of two and a half pounds per acre, then the additional capital laid out would amount only to six and a quarter pound, i.e. the total outlay on A and B for the production of these six quarters would only be 11 and a quarter pounds instead of 15 pounds, and their total production costs, including profit, would be 13 and a half pounds. The six quarters would still be sold together for 18 pounds as before, but the capital outlay would have decreased by three and three quarters pounds, and the rent on B would come to four and a half pounds per acre, again as before. It would be a different matter if in order to produce the extra two and a half quarters, it were necessary to resort to worse land than A, to A subprime one or A subprime two, with a resulting production price per quarter for one and a half quarters on land A subprime one of four pounds, and for the final quarter on A subprime two of six pounds. In this case, six pounds would be the governing production price per quarter, the three and a half quarters for B would be sold for 21 pounds instead of for 10 and a half pounds, which would give a rent of 15 pounds instead of four and a half, and of two and a half quarters in corn instead of one and a half quarter. On A, similarly, the one quarter would now yield a rent of three pounds, i.e. half a quarter. One final remark before we discuss this point further. The average price of a quarter on B is equalized and coincides with the general production price of three pounds per quarter governed by A as soon as the part of the total capital that produces the additional one and a half quarters is offset by the part of the total capital that produces the deficient one and a half quarters. How soon this equalization is reached, or how much capital must be invested on B with deficient productivity for it to be reached, depends, taking the surplus productivity of the first capital investments as given, on the relative underproductivity of the capitals later replied, compared with an equally large capital investment on the poorest price-governing land A, or on the individual production price of the product of this investment compared with the governing price. Here is the next point that arises from the foregoing. Firstly, as long as the additional capitals are invested on the same land with surplus productivity, even if this is decreasing, the absolute corn and money rent per acre rises, even if it declines relatively, in proportion to the capital advanced, i.e. the rate of surplus profit or rent. The limit here is formed by that additional capital which yields only the average profit, or for whose product the individual production price coincides with the general one. The production price remains the same under these conditions as long as the increased supply does not make production from the poorer types of land superfluous. Even with the falling price, these additional capitals can still produce a surplus profit within certain limits, even if a smaller one. Secondly, the investment of additional capital which produces only the average profit, i.e. whose surplus productivity equals zero, does not alter the amount of surplus profit, and hence rent, that is formed. The individual average price per quarter, therefore, rises on the better types of land. The excess per quarter declines, but the number of quarters bearing this reduced excess increases in such a way that the product of the two remains the same. Thirdly, additional capital investments, for which the individual production price of their products stands above the governing price, so that their surplus productivity is not just nothing but less than nothing, a negative quantity, i.e. a productivity less than that of the same capital investment on the price governing land A. These additional investments bring the average price of the total product of the better land ever closer to the general production price, and thus more and more reduce the difference between the two, which is what forms the surplus profit or rent. More and more of what would form surplus profit or rent goes into the formation of the average profit, and yet for all that, the total capital invested on an acre of B continues to yield a surplus profit, even if this declines with the increasing amount of capital of deficient productivity and with the level of this underproductivity. The rent per acre in this case falls in absolute terms as capital grows and production increases and does not just fall relatively to the growing size of the capital invested, as it does in the second case. The rent can disappear only if the individual average production price of the total product on the better land B coincides with the governing price, i.e. if the entire surplus profit of the earlier and more productive capital investments has been used to form the average profit. The minimum limit to the fall in the rent per acre is the point at which this disappears, but this point is not reached as soon as the extra capital investments produce with deficient productivity, but only when the extra investment of deficiently productive portions of capital becomes so great that its effect cancels out the surplus productivity of the first capital investments, so that the productivity of the total capital invested comes to be equal to that of the capital on A, and hence the individual average price per quarter on B equal to that on A.
Even in this case, the governing price of production, that is three pounds per quarter, remains the same, although the rent has vanished. It is only beyond this point that the production price would have to rise, as the result of an increase either in the degree of deficient productivity of the surplus capital or in the amount of extra capital of the same deficient productivity. If in the table on page 865, for example, two and a half quarters were produced at four pounds per quarter on the same land instead of one and a half quarters, we would have altogether seven quarters for a production cost of 22 pounds. The cost would now be three and one-seventh pounds per quarter, i.e. one-seventh of a pound higher than the general production price, which would have to rise. Thus, extra capital with deficient productivity, and even capital with increasingly deficient productivity, could still be applied for a long while before the individual average price per quarter on the best lands became equal to the general price of production, i.e. before the excess of the latter over the former, and hence surplus profit and rent completely disappeared. Even in this case, moreover, the disappearance of rent on the better types of land would mean only that the individual production price of the product from these better types would coincide with the general price of production. No rise in this general price would yet be required. In the above example, taking the better land B, which however is lowest in the series of better or rent-bearing land types, three and a half quarters was produced by a capital of five pounds with surplus productivity, and two and a half quarters by a capital of ten pounds with deficient productivity, making a total of six quarters, i.e. five-twelfths of the total was produced by the latter portions of capital that are invested at deficient productivity. And it is only at this point that the individual average production price of the six quarters rises to three pounds per quarter, coinciding, therefore, with the general production price. Under the law of landed property, however, the latter two and a half quarters could not have been produced in this manner at three pounds per quarter, except in the case where it could be produced on two and a half new acres of type A land. The case in which the extra capital only produces at the general price of production would have imposed a limit. Beyond this, extra capital investment on the same land would have to cease. If the farmer has to pay, say, four and a half pounds rent for the first two capital investments, he must continue to pay it, and any capital investment that needs more than three pounds to produce a quarter would involve a deduction from his profit. In the case of deficient productivity, therefore, equalization of the individual average price is thereby prevented. Let us take this case in connection with the previous example, where the production price of three pounds per quarter on land A governs the price for B. The production costs of the three and a half quarters from the first two capital investments are similarly three pounds per quarter for the farmer, since he has to pay a rent of four and a half pounds, so that the difference between his individual production price and the general production price does not flow into his pocket. For him, therefore, the surplus in the price of the product of the first two capital investments cannot serve to balance the deficit suffered on the products of the third and fourth capital investments. The one and a half quarters from investment number three cost the farmer six pounds, profit included, but he can sell only for four and a half pounds, taking the governing price at three pounds per quarter. Thus, he would lose not only the entire profit, but half a pound or 10% of his invested capital of five pounds into the bargain. His loss in profit and capital for the third investment would come to one and a half pounds, and for the fourth investment, three pounds, together making four and a half, exactly as much as the rent for the better capital investments, whose individual production price, however, cannot go into the individual average production price of B's total product as a compensating factor, since this surplus is paid out to a third party as rent. If it were necessary for the third capital investment to produce its extra one and a half quarters in order to meet the demand, the governing market price would have to rise to four pounds per quarter. As a result of this increase in the governing market price, the rent on B would rise for the first and second capital investment, and a rent would be formed on A. Thus, even though the differential rent is only a formal transformation of surplus profit into rent, and in this case, landed property simply enables the landowner to transfer the farmer's surplus profit to himself, it transpires that the successive investments of capital on the same stretch of land, or what comes to the same thing, the increase in the capital invested on the same land, tends rather to find its limit in this transference, given a declining rate of productivity on capital and a constant governing price. In fact, it comes up against a more or less artificial barrier, a result of the merely formal transformation of surplus profit into ground rent, which is the consequence of landed property. 
The rise in the general price of production, which becomes necessary here, where the limit is narrower than elsewhere, is in this case, therefore, not only the basis for the rise in the differential rent, but the existence of differential rent as rent is at the same time the basis for the earlier and more rapid rise in the general price of production, in order thereby to guarantee the increased supply of the product that has become necessary. The following should also be noted. The governing price could not rise to four pounds as above, thanks to the extra capital on land B, if land A were to supply the extra product for less than four pounds, or if newer and poorer land than A came into competition, with a price of production that was above three pounds but below four. We thus see how differential rent one and differential rent two, while the first is the basis of the second, at the same time place limits on one another leading sometimes to successive investments of capital on the same stretch of land and sometimes to adjacent investments of capital on new additional land. They have a similar effect as limits to one another in other cases, for example, where better land is taken up.